Uh, good evening. I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, uh, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, and I'm happy to, to welcome those of you who are joining us in person. Uh, and we also had 237 people registered to attend online. So I'm uh, also ha happy to welcome the people joining us to, uh, virtually. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is the first historical society in America. Uh, we date back to 1791, uh, and as I uh, like to, to point out, uh, when we were founded, our founding uh, president, Jeremy Belknap, uh, wrote a letter to Paul Revere, and Paul Revere wrote back. So we've been around collecting material, uh, documenting it, preserving it, and presenting it to the public uh, for the past 232 years. Um, just as an example uh, of what's in our collection, uh, as we do for many of our programs, uh, our chief historian, Peter Drummy, uh, has pulled together a small display, which was on uh, in the room that we had the uh, reception, uh, which featured uh, photographs of Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge uh, throughout their lives. Um, these are part of the Lodge family papers, which are held at MHS. So we uh, sample from our collection to put together small displays for many of our programs. Uh, and all of this material we make available to the public, uh, for the researchers for free. Um, we also host a wide variety of programs. Um, we're only able to host programs like this thanks to the support of our members and donors. So I hope that you enjoy the program this evening, and I hope that if you enjoy it, you'll come back to future programs, and I hope that you'll consider becoming a member uh, and supporting our work. Uh, this evening, we are happy to welcome Dr. Lawrence Jordan, uh, who will be in conversation with MHS Chief Historian Peter Drummy. Uh, Dr. Jordan is an adjunct professor of history at Fairfield University and Fordham College's uh, Lincoln Center campus. Uh, he is the author of Paving the Way for Reagan, the Influence of Conservative Media on U.S. Foreign Policy. Uh, he is also a frequent writer on American politics, and his articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, this evening, uh, he will be speaking uh, with Peter Drummy uh, about his latest book, The Rough Rider and the Professor, which chronicles the extraordinary 35-year friendship between President Theodore Roosevelt and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. So without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Well, Lawrence, let me begin by congratulating you on the publication of The Rough Rider and The Professor. Um, you're a graceful writer yourself, but I think writers who write about writers, and both Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge have long, active, interesting lives. But um, there's an old political joke that Theodore Roosevelt wrote more books than some American presidents have read. <laughs> And um, as long as uh, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge is probably most well known as someone who wrote about people from the early Republic, um, Alexander Hamilton, people who were the sort of models for his political thinking to some extent in his own autobiographical writing, but nevertheless is a wonderful writer as well. And that's a challenge that I think it's hard for people to take on, that not to have a book that ends up stitching quotations from writers together to make a book. And this certainly doesn't. This is a, a, a wonderful analysis of two interesting but complicated people and how somehow they were, I'm doing all the speaking rather than asking, but doing all the kind of how their connection was so important to their um, uh, careers. But could you start out, just tell us what brought you to this, um, the idea of this book, and why you think that this is such an important subject for us to think about today. Yes, and I just want to say how pleased I am to be here and how pleased I am to to have Peter as my conversation partner who is so uh, diligent and kind and helpful in guiding me through uh, the Lodge archives. For those of you who haven't seen any of the Lodge papers, and I encourage you to look at the display that Peter has wonderfully created, uh, Lodge's writing is essentially illegible. <laughs> um, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to to all the different archives I was able to uh, look to to find uh, letters of his that were actually typed, <laughs> because uh, I, I, it is it is very very difficult to to read his writings. Tr 
Uh, not more so. But again, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see so many of you, and especially you all have come out on such a uh, kind of a, a warm, to say the least, <laughs> evening. Um, but I, uh, the book kind of came to fruition, uh, you know, in around 2020 or, or so when we were all locked down by COVID and I was locked down as well. I wasn't out there teaching. I was teaching remotely and I'd always wanted to write a commercial book. I mean, I see myself as a storyteller and I'm an academic, but I write books primarily. So everybody can read them. So everybody has access to these wonderful characters and wonderful events and wonderful ideas. And I thought to myself, you know, I'd love to write about a great friendship. And I was sitting around, uh, you know, researching and thinking, and I thought, well, Henry Cabot Lodge and Theodore Roosevelt, but why hasn't there been anything written about them in terms of one uh, monograph? I mean, for those of you who have read any of the books on TR, Lodge is always there. You know, he's kind of deep under the surface, so to speak. He's not someone who's who's obvious, but he's always there. And then there's that caricature of him, of this kind of very serious, kind of humorless uh, man, which he was. Uh, <laughs> not a great sense of humor there. Um, but I thought, you know, it could be wonderful to see what this friendship was actually like. And then, you know, digging through the correspondence and the fact that Roosevelt and Lodge wrote to one another, they wrote 2,500 letters to one another over the course of 35 years. Some letters they wrote maybe two to three uh, a day, uh, Lodge writing much more to TR than TR wrote to Lodge. Um, and it's just fascinating to, to look at these letters, letters that neither really expected anyone to see. And so they're, you know, completely uh, vulnerable in terms of what they're writing about. You know, literally uh, Roosevelt writing to Lodge, Lodge writing to Roosevelt at one point saying, I, you know, I've, I've, I've loved you and I've loved you well, uh, talking about what a, a great friend Roosevelt uh, has been, the loss of, of, of various spouses and children, just the, the, the pain, the, the, the openness to all of it. And I thought, what a wonderful project. And fortunately, I was able to uh, stitch it together and, and I hope have done an, an, an adequate uh, job. And I wrote this proposal, uh, submitted it, an agent picked it up. Uh, one publisher accepted it, the last one. <laughs> uh, because everybody said, huh? Who wants to read another book about Roosevelt? And in fact, the review in the Washington Post last week says, do we really need another book about Roosevelt? And fortunately, the book was positive. And my wife sent out a little note on Facebook. Do we need another book on Roosevelt? Yes, actually, we do. So I was very grateful for that. But um, both men are incredible characters. I can't imagine what they must have been like to know. Uh, but it was a book that came together. I was fortunate very, very well. And one I adored writing. And I hope this gives those of you who, who, who are kind enough to read the book a new sense of perhaps what Henry Cabot Lodge uh, was like, that he was much more complex, much more perhaps unique, much more varied, uh, much more interesting than I think we might uh, give him credit for us. And certainly uh, in terms of me, who was told that Henry Cabot Lodge was the guy responsible for the destruction of the League of Nations and the stroke that Woodrow Wilson ultimately uh, suffered. I, I think this is a, a really important point that um, some stereotypes are true that based upon, the, but I think that in looking at this, this is like a, it's not a buried treasure. These are papers that have been here um, for a long time, were published, the letters, a selection of letters are published um, essentially soon after the deaths of the correspondence Lodge and um, Roosevelt published in the mid-1920s. I think we'll get in a few minutes to the 
problematic nature of that publication of their papers. But I thought maybe it's worth going back. I think you've put this very well, but um, Roosevelt is someone who is more familiar to us. And maybe it's worth saying the re saying something about their relationship between them. And I think the kind of the story everybody understands is that they met at college. And that simply, it, they may have seen each other, but that's not the case. They met, I think, in a much more interesting way, not too long after. Yes, I mean, it, it, it is very interesting to take Peter's point. Uh, Lodge and Roosevelt did meet at Harvard, though it was a, I might say, a very, sorry? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. I think you and I met there. <laughs> uh, but um, they were seven and a half or so years apart. Lodge was teaching at Harvard. He was teaching a course, I'm going to say, on colonial history. And I'm glad Peter's here because Peter knows everything <laughs> oh. about Henry Cabot Lodge. So he'll, you know, I want you to step in if, if I'm slightly off. But uh, Lodge was someone who uh, was teaching colonial history. Uh, he had something like 15, 17 people in his class initially that rapidly descended to about four or five <laughs> soon after. As someone said to me the other day, they, they didn't have student evaluations. <laughs> you, 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 you didn't know. And, and, and Roosevelt was there and they were both members of Porcellian. Uh, Lodge admitted that he enjoyed Porcellian perhaps a little too much, enjoyed the library, was there frequently, was there for uh, various events. And he probably met Roosevelt there. I also think, and I, maybe Roosevelt, I think, made the point in a letter I read, and Peter, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they may have met at a uh, an engagement function because uh, Roosevelt's first wife was a distant cousin yeah. uh, to the Lodges. This so is Alice Lee. Alice Lee. Um, so uh, they may have met uh, there, but they really came to know one another uh, through politics. Uh, both men were ambitious uh, politicians. It's, uh, there's something very admirable, I think, about Lodge and Roosevelt. And the fact that both of them were affluent, both of them had money, they could live on, rest on their laurels, if, if one might say that. But both Lodge and Roosevelt wanted to do something bigger. They wanted to be significant. They wanted to do something that might stand the test of time. And so Lodge, as a man who, as, as one wrote, uh, someone once wrote, had uh, the voice that sounded as if it was the tearing of a bedsheet. <laughs> or um, I actually have heard that it really sounds more like a drill, <laughs> essentially. And Lodge has joked about that. They literally said, you know, and, and, and Roosevelt's voice was not much better. It was very high, very squeaky. If you go online, you can hear both of both of these, depending on how much, you know, how much, how sensitive your ears are, whether you want to endure, you allow yourself to be endure that. But um, they were individuals who, who relished history, who relished uh, the United States, who were passionate about uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and they wanted to serve their community. And so they both came together during the very contentious campaign of 1884. Uh, during that campaign, uh, the nominee for the Republican Party was a gentleman by the name of James G. Blaine of Maine. Uh, a very good looking- Maine, yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, a very good looking man who had a very long white beard that was so stark and had so, so clearly white. And whether this is true or not, I don't know, because I couldn't find any evidence, didn't put it in the book. But apparently there was a, at one time, there was a sharpshooter that had positioned himself on the Capitol, Capitol Dome and was able to locate Lane purely because of the fact that his beard was as white <laughs> as so clear that he could just take a shot 
uh, at him. And I'm sure Blaine didn't like being shot at because, of course, he was next to President Garfield when Garfield was was shot. So, you know, I don't think it made him the most stable person in the world. But uh, Blaine was not well regarded by Roosevelt Lodge or any of the other what they called mugwumps uh, during that time. Someone, these sort of very um, college educated Eastern elite, many from from here, many from Boston. Many uh, members of the Historical Society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could call them actually members of the Beacon Hill set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they really found Blaine despicable. And Lodge and Roosevelt were uh, not far from that. They both were very unhappy with Blaine. They were hoping that someone else uh, could be selected by the Republicans that year. But they were in a bit of a quandary because each man had officially said that they would vote for the person who was nominated by the Republican Party, by their respective delegations, Roosevelt in New York, Lodge in Massachusetts. And when they were unable to topple Blaine from the standard bearer position, they chose to support Blaine publicly for the nomination. This did not go over well. Lodge was running for Congress at the time, his first attempt at a run for Congress. Uh, the liberal Republicans led by, we could say, Charles Eliot, sort of Lodge's nemesis, the former, the Harvard president at the time, um, really went after him. And essentially the liberals along with several others prevented Lodge from being elected to Congress. Lodge was also blackballed socially in Beacon Hill. He was a member of the Somerset Club. It was not easy to find a luncheon partner after uh, that uh, moment in 1884. Uh, Roosevelt was also um, essentially uh, did not fare very well either. Uh, he had come off of his uh, legislative career. Alice Lee had died that year. Roosevelt's mother had died on the same day within moments of one another. And between those two deaths, the disaster in 1884, Roosevelt stood down from politics. He retreated to his ranch in Dakota, expecting never to be politically competitive again. Lodge uh, deter was determined to go on. He was determined to achieve success in politics, whatever cost, Beacon Hill, be damned. And that is really where that relationship blossomed. Two men pushing against the grain, pushing against the tide of their class and uh, station in life, but who were determined to persevere and achieve greatness just the same. Yeah, this is a, um, a where the we have a kind of outline of a story and uh, kind of we can fill it in with make it logical these two people were at harvard at the same time they were from different states but the same social station but in fact the the real story is more interesting and sh shows more three-dimensional characters i'm going to jump around a little bit but you have um if this was a play that you had written there are so many dramatic characters in it but i want to point out um two people who play important roles in the story of um lodge and roosevelt's um um connection and that is their wives um um, um roosevelt's second wife um uh edith and um nanny lodge um i hope i get this right Anna Cabot Mills Davis Lodge, um, which is a spectacular name in its own, but really two extraordinary women who, um, in some respects, are kind of scene stealers when they come into this. And actually, if you think of this as a story told through correspondence, um, Nanny Lodge is often the person that um, uh, 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 TR is writing to. Henry Cabot, HCL, Henry Cabot Lodge, 
But in fact, he's writing to Nanny Lodge and he has the pretext of putting some um, um, information about politics at the front of a letter. But then when he turns to literature or um, art or um, uh, culture, the letter is clearly directed to her. So they're, so at one end, they're sharing these letters. Um, 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 and the, um, how did you kind of figure out how to put them in the story without, frankly, them taking over the story? Yeah, no, it, it was, it was difficult. I, I, I admit, uh, Nanny Lodge was my favorite person in the book. I, I adored her. I thought she was fabulous. You know, she's the kind of, of woman, I, just someone who was not only breathtakingly beautiful, but she was also intellectually top notch. She had, she went to Wellesley. She had a photographic, and I think as well, an audiographic memory. She could recite Shakespeare. She could recite all of the great uh, poets. Uh, when Lodge met her on the train um, um, at, I'm sorry, what was the name of the town just right near Nahant, where you, where the, you would, I can't, I can't remember the, the name of the station. Definitely. Yeah. When, when she came off, in any regard, she came off of the, the train tracks. She was carrying the life of, of, of Samuel Johnson. <laughs> And Lodge was like, oh, that's the woman for me. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, she, she, huh? What was the reading? Uh, Anna Mills uh, Cabot, Anna Cabot Mills Davis. Davis, uh, yeah. Yeah, Davis, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was her father, Admiral Davis, had been a very well regarded naval figure. He had fought in the Civil War, uh, had been very close with Lincoln. Uh, had been a pallbearer at the president's funeral. Uh, and she knew everything about nautical affairs, nautical history. Um, it was just something, and, and that was one of the reasons that so many men found her so compelling, because she wasn't only physically attractive, but she was mentally stimulating as well. And, and TR adored her. Um, James Blaine adored her. There, there's a moment where uh, Blaine has sort of helped manage uh, Harrison's campaign for president. And he's given the position of secretary of state and he needs an undersecretary. And he writes to Nanny Lodge and says, I need a gentleman who can speak German, who's of such an age, of such an education. You do you have a marvelous office, best view in Washington? Do you know anyone? And of course, Nanny Lodge immediately said, Well, of course, Theodore Roosevelt would be ideal. <laughs> and this shows you the devotion that HCL, Henry Cabot Lodge, had for uh, TR. Now, really, the fact that Henry Cabot Lodge was trying to engineer the defeat of James Blaine several years earlier, and then he says, he, he goes to him, you know, on bended knee and says, you know, would you consider making uh, Theodore your undersecretary of state? And Blaine is just like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but Blaine did it in a very elegant way. You know, he wrote Nanny Lodge and he said, you know, I think Theodore is very capable, but I just feel as if. I, my evenings and vacations at Bar Harbor could be very disturbed <laughs> if I gave him uh, an opportunity because I, I just don't think I'd sleep very well. <laughs> and, and, and so, of course, there was that. But, but Nanny was, was just terrific. And, and Edith was as well. Just an aside on, on Nanny for a minute. Uh, Nanny uh, read... Every speech that Henry Cabot Lodge delivered, any draft of significance from a book point of view, she read it. She was the first person to read it. And if she didn't like it, she would tell her husband that. And even if it was a line that was off, he'd rip the whole thing up, throw it into the fire and start again. <laughs> and she did, she did that, I think, on one particular speech where he had to write it three or four times before 
She said, well, that's all right. Um, Edith Roosevelt was another uh, beautiful woman, another also incredibly uh, intelligent woman whose great passion was literature. She had that uh, rapprochement with, with Henry Cabot Lodge, and they would talk about literature together. It made her feel very comfortable because initially when she met him, when the two returned after their honeymoon, and Henry Cabot Lodge was sitting there, as I'm sure if you've seen any of these pictures, in a very kind of intimidating, he's a very intimidating looking man. And they started talking about literature and books, and she settled right down to the point that she wrote Roosevelt. She said, you know, if something were to happen to you, the only person I would want to hear that from is Cabot. It's the only person I, would, I could really take that from. And, and she and Cabot, in a way, we're sort of partners in terms of dealing with Roosevelt, in terms of controlling that unpredictable temperament that he had. Edith had a, a great way at really calming uh, Theodore Roosevelt down. Not always, but she was very good at that. Uh, she knew him better, perhaps, than he knew himself. I don't know how many of you know, but they had known one another since they were children. Uh, and, and she knew that, for instance, if he took the vice presidency, it could be emotionally disastrous for him because Roosevelt always relished and thrived in an active environment. The vice presidency is certainly then was not an active place, nor uh, would it be active with someone like William McKinley and Mark Hanna, McKinley's great strategist who disliked Roosevelt intensely and was not going to allow him to get an iota of influence or power. But these two women were really extraordinary uh, uh, women and, and I think really added uh, to the lives of these, of these two men and really were responsible in a small way of helping them get to where they ultimately uh, uh, got to. I'm I'm, j I'm jumping around here, but there's this book is so rich. I think it the best way to kind of understand it is through um, not vignettes, but where individuals or actions sort of reveal these two people and how they work together and sometimes were at odds with each other and work through that as well, which I think is an important part of the story. You don't have, these were lifelong friends, but you don't have to be friends to work with people in politics. And one thing that has a, is a local aspect to the story is, um, after the retirement of a Supreme Court justice from Massachusetts, Horace Gray, um, there is the question of who will replace Gray on the Supreme Court. And there is at the time, there is more or less a tradition that the seat would be go to a person from Massachusetts, not in any official way, but that had been a tradition. And so this is where you have mentor, advisor, lodge, senator from Massachusetts, younger Roosevelt. Roosevelt is by then, the 192 is uh, essentially an accidental president, the vice president, the president in waiting with the assassination of McKinley. And the nomination of um, by Roosevelt of Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. to the Supreme Court is perhaps not as obvious it is from where we're sitting, knowing his career thereafter. But do you want to talk a little bit about how that sort of came, how it sort of the 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 balance between them sort of was shifting at that time? Yeah, I, I think selection of 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 homes and and sort of the role that Lodge played within that is sort of indicative of where the relationship uh had had gone. First, a, a little bit of, of background, if I, if I may. Holmes was an old friend of Lodge's. He was one of the few men who had not retreated when uh, Lodge was uh, ostracized uh, by the Beacon Hill set in 1884. Lodge never forgot that. Lodge was a devoted friend to those who stood with him. Uh, he would do anything for them. 
but he had a long memory. If you crossed him, he never forgot it. He never forgot it. And uh, he, you know, he, he remembered. And so when that moment arose, where Roosevelt was looking for someone to be his first Supreme Court nominee, Lodge said, well, you know, what about, what about, um, what about Wendell? But the relationship had shifted by this point. Before Roosevelt becomes president, the correspondence are, I would almost say very much, uh, there, there's desperation in that, in the correspondence initially. But I don't know, if Peter, if you, if you agree in terms of, of Roosevelt reaching out to Lodge, I need this, can you do this for me? Uh, I could really use your help. I really need your advice. I really would love to meet with you about this and that. Um, after Roosevelt becomes president, things shift. Roosevelt still loves seeing Lodge. He loves having dinner with he and Nanny. He loves going for walks with Lodge. He loves going for rides with the senator through, uh, through uh, Rock Creek Park. Uh, they love chatting about foreign affairs. Roosevelt is constantly updating uh, Lodge about the Russo-Japanese war. But there's that very kind of delicate line that Roosevelt knows he needs to walk. And the example I'll, I'll give you is soon after Roosevelt becomes president, a journalist comes over to him and says, well, Mr. President, I'm wondering, how are you going to deal with this issue of Senator Lodge? And many people believe that, that he, and this is, this is me talking, has, has sort of a carte blanche to the White House in terms of asking you for a favor and the fact that you all have this, this lengthy history. And Roosevelt looked at him, looked at the journalist and said, no, 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 you don't understand this at all. Lodge does not run me. I run Lodge. And, and that to me was a very strong statement because for a long time within kind of you know, the, the journalistic circles and among Capitol Hill gossip, you know, there had been this phrase of oh, the firm of Lodge and Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the junior partner to Lodge. And now things had completely changed. And Roosevelt, while still having a great deal of affection for Lodge, knew that he couldn't allow people to believe that Lodge had some sort of, of influence over him. And in terms of so when we go back to the Wendell Holmes thing, certainly uh, Holmes was selected, turned out to be a very disappointing selection for Theodore Roosevelt, something that kind of he blamed Lodge for. Uh, but Roosevelt also had interviewed, uh, Roosevelt had interviewed Holmes extensively. They had had extensive conversations. Uh, uh, Roosevelt liked um, liked Holmes a, a great deal. Of course, he was a fellow Harvard man, so why not? Um, but um, Lodge certainly did engineer that. He certainly got Holmes in the door, but without Roosevelt uh, appreciating uh, Holmes's intellect, it wouldn't have happened. As, as, as Lodge wrote years earlier when, they were, when there was some issue uh, back when he first came to know TR, he said, you could not pressure Theodore Roosevelt. That was not something that, that anyone uh, could do. And I think Lodge understood that. But still, there were many occasions where he tried to use their friendship to get TR to do things that Roosevelt didn't want to do. And Roosevelt would push back. And I'll give one, if I may, one, one example. Uh, there was to be the 200th anniversary of Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, around 1902, I'm going to say. And, and, and Cabot writes TR a, a missive and he says, oh, you know, I was, I was talking to the, the mayor of Brookline. And I said that you'd write him a proclamation and I think it would be just wonderful. Well, Roosevelt 
writes Lodge back and he says, and he literally says, my dear fellow, don't make a request like that for me again. Everybody's asking me to do this. I get dozens of these things a day. I don't need to get that from you. Lodge, I think, was really taken aback because he literally wrote Roosevelt a few days later, oh, I was just kidding. <laughs> Lodge had no sense of humor. <laughs> um, I do want to turn to questions both from you either here and from our online audience. But I thought, just as an aside, and something that's real, I mean, the book is wonderful, but it, it, there's a brief appendix attached to it, which I think is really important for people to think about when we think about how you read and study history. And that is um, the Lodge Roosevelt correspondence, Roosevelt Lodge correspondence, has been known about and was published, edited by um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt died in 1919. Um, Lodge lived on until 1924, not in good health, still in the Senate, um, but devoting a lot of time to editing their correspondence with each other, um, selecting letters from this vast 2,500 um, pieces of correspondence um, for a two-volume edition. And um, it is largely how historians have understood their relationship um, and where they stood on all the issues of the day, because they discussed everything um, until relatively recently. And it, this is not so much, I would say, a discovery as an explanation of how complicated this is. So with that kind of wordy introduction... <laughs> Do you want to talk yeah, about sure. that? Yeah, sure. It was it was really interesting to me. Um, I I and I uh, one of the the man who really wrote the definitive biography of of, of Lodge is it was a gentleman named John Garrity who was a historian who taught at Columbia, and he wrote a biography of Lodge that came out I'd say in 1952. Yeah, that's about it. Under the auspices of Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Uh, who Peter and I were speaking about, and who was also very involved here at um, the Historical Society. Um, when uh, Lodge and uh, TR were sitting together at various points in their, in their la later lives, uh, Roosevelt said to Lodge, you know, it would be a great book if you edited all of the chorus, if you put all the correspondence that we had and stuck it in a couple of volumes, it could be one of the great books in history. He basically said that. I'm not making that up. <laughs> yes, that's right. And, and, um, and Lodge, you know, uh, after TR passes away and his, he's spending more time on his own writing with uh, his grandchildren and thinking about things, not having... Uh, that's not that great hunger for for political power as he once had, but also he was kind of isolated by Calvin Coolidge, who was yet another Massachusetts man uh, and in the White House. And there was, I think, some difficulty in that relationship there, which I, I hadn't ever explored. So I'm not super familiar. But um, Lodge started going through the correspondence. And he looked at all the letters and he realized that there were certain comments that both he and TR had made about certain individuals that perhaps should not see the light of day. And he wrote to Edith Roosevelt's widow and said, you know, I understand how you would like him to be TR to be portrayed. I would like him to be portrayed the same way. Some of these letters will never see the light of day. And, and Lodge literally crossed things off, uh, removed things from uh, the letters. For instance, uh, there was a period of time where Roosevelt was very unhappy with President Harrison uh, because Harrison was not listening uh, to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt wrote a letter to Lodge in which he referred to Harrison as a, as a boob, as a toad um, and, and a few other things. Those letters were, those terms were removed from the correspondence. In fact, the letters, I don't believe the letters actually in the correspondence. Yes, and, yeah. and um, you know, it, it's, it is 
it was really a, a, a terrible thing. And John Garrity was the first person who really raised this. And uh, there have been several Roosevelt biographers who have also noted this. But I thought that since my book, the foundation of my book was based on these letters, I needed to write a bit more of an explanation. And I thought about the fact that it was extremely hypocritical since Henry Cabot Lodge received one of the first history PhDs from Harvard and considered himself a historian and then proceeds to take a book that really could potentially have been one of the most important works in the history of Theodore Roosevelt, let alone in American history, and alter it and change it to basically make the book unreliable, the two volumes unreliable and completely useless. Um, it's, it's really something that demeaned both their memories, especially Theodore Roosevelt, because Lodge said on more than one occasion that Theodore Roosevelt considered himself a completely open book. Well, if he's an open book, <laughs> why don't you just leave everything as is? And so um, I, I, I really went through those correspondence and had to go through and thank God the originals here, deposited here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. One of the scholars are still able to come and, and, and look at them. But uh, that volume, those two volumes, the selected correspondence and selected key word, <laughs> I think, uh, it's just terribly un unfortunate and, and is a real disservice to history um, in, in doing that. But that that's, a I think, an important part. And I think Lawrence been correct in crediting people who have understood this, but these volumes live on. They're easily accessible. They're on the ebook online services. So they're a, a first resort. That's, you know, if you're looking for correspondence at, and not studying in depth, um, I think they're still available. They're, they're perfectly readable. I mean, it, it's, it's nothing like having a careful editor go through your correspondence to sort of clean it up to make it readable in that sense. That's what makes it so dangerous. It gives the it gives you the impression you're seeing directly what Roosevelt and Lodge wrote to each other, and you're not. And that's the virtue of having a repository and preserving the original manuscripts. One that thing I wanted to say, um, the interesting thing is the one letter that is, well, there are many letters that are accurate in, in that edited book. I'm not going to say they're all, many of them are. But the one letter that I would have expected to have been altered and was not was the letter that Lodge wrote to Roosevelt in 1912, breaking with him politically over their disagreement of TR's positions that he was taking in the 1912 campaign. He literally says to him, I cannot recall, I'm paraphrasing, when I've, I've been hurt this badly. And he, he goes on and, and talks about how wounded he is by the fact that Roosevelt's taken these positions that he's completely shocked by. He thought, I knew you so well, I guess I didn't. And to me, leaving that letter unaltered in the published correspondence really is a statement. He didn't do that. Lodge, Henry Cabot Lodge never did anything uh, uh, without a reason. And the fact that he left that letter there says to me, he really wanted to tell people, you know, I was really wounded. That was really hurtful. Uh, TR really, really hurt me. This close guy I considered the closest friend in my life really wounded me at one time. And I want everybody to know it. And last, I'll, I'll, before, and then we will turn to questions. I just want to point out that, um, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge was a member of the Massachusetts Historical Society from 1876 to 1920, his death in 1924. For the last years of his life, after 1915, the president of the Historical Society, he he was in this building, this older part of the building you're in. He um, he hosted as vice president in 1912 
just after the election, Theodore Roosevelt was not a member of the Historical Society, but came here for a reception in his honor while there was the, the American Historical Association was meeting in Boston. And it was a reception for him. If you're familiar with the building downstairs and what's in our reading room, there was a buffet put on for him. Old friend here to greet him, Henry Cabot Lodge. But um, he, uh, um, as many people separated by generations, um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt didn't get along with the then president of the Historical Society, Charles Francis Adams Jr. at all. They were at odds. So there was this buffet lunch in, in reception for Roosevelt here at the end of 1912 and downstairs with, with all the food put out, their, their respective friends, the friends of CFA2, as we call them, and the friends of TR sort of managed to keep them at off but it's at ends of the buffet table. So they're living presence in this, both men in this building. And the joker in the deck is because he was a history professor before he was the head of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson was a long-term corresponding member of the Historical Society, which I find slightly hilarious in terms of this being this bastion of um, kind of good government republicanism, uh, as well as the MHS. And and Lodge actually put an article of Wilson's in one of the, <laughs> an early journal that he edited, which, which, you know, you have to figure that for all of Lodge's hatred of Wilson, at least he thought, well, you know, intellectually, he's not entirely, yeah. you know, at the bottom of the heap. Um, so, Constitutional so scholar. So um, we're going to open this up for questions, and there'll be both questions in person. If you have a question, just wait till the microphone comes around to you so everyone hears it here and online. And then Olivia will be feel, um, fielding questions from our online audience. I'm wondering if you know what Nanny Lodge's views were on women's suffrage. I have no idea. I uh, I, the, one of the interesting things that, that I found was when I, during the, uh, the election that, uh, I think it was the election of 1896, um, William Jennings Bryan was on the Democratic side. Nanny Lodge was quite taken with him. <laughs> uh, she, in fact, wrote a, a letter uh, saying this guy was absolutely, even though, you know, McKinley won the election, this guy's fantastic. Uh, she talked about his oratory, his physicality. Uh, she was clearly thought he was quite fetching. Um, but I don't know, uh, what she thought about women's suffrage. You know, she, um, in some ways was a very, uh, advanced thinker. But I think like many women of that era and, and women of an earlier era, someone like another uh, Massachusetts woman, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, very much saw herself as a wife, mother, no, that's a homemaker. Uh, that was really her role. She actually wrote uh, to Corinne Roosevelt, uh, TR's sister at one point, that when Corinne said, oh, you know, you are so responsible for Cabot's career. And she said, no, I'm not. He would have achieved greatness without anybody, it didn't matter. So I think she kept a lot of these views and opinions. She was not someone who liked being, even she wasn't even someone who liked being photographed. It, I really wanted to find a beautiful picture of, of Nanny Lodge. It's very hard to find one. I found one of her in a coach with TR, when TR makes his first visit as president to Nahant. And Nanny Lodge is there in the coach, more so serving as, as the overseer of this caravan that was going to follow uh, TR and she to uh, the Lodge estate. And she has her head over her shoulder like this, beautiful blonde hair uh, tied up in a, in a large, uh, Buffon, as, as was the uh, order of the day, and a black hat on, a black scarf, and you can see exquisite features. But she was not someone who I think really was, viewed herself as a public person. 
uh, John Singer Sargent, great portraitist, wanted to paint her? She said, no, I don't want that. That might say a lot in itself. It didn't, and Henry Cabot Lodge could be very pragmatic. Um, um, he, I think he understood that in um, 1918 and 1920, the elections, um, he, he, he essentially, in his role as a senator, had said this should be decided locally, um, that, that there shouldn't be a national policy. In fact, tried to move the Republican Party away from um, uh, anti-women suffrage. But here in Massachusetts, the Republican um, candidate for um, senator, the other candidate for senator, ran on an anti-suffrage um Plank and was defeated by, as the Republicans described, the Democrats, who, while the Republicans were winning nationally, were losing locally, described it as being defeated by, how do you put this, the short haired women and the long haired men, the sort of radical, you know, this idea that, that, that there was something frivolous or outlandish about the uh, women's suffrage movement, even after being defeated essentially along those lines. What was their um, relationship or friendship like after the breach in 1912? Well, how did know, they reconcile well, or did they? They, they, they reconciled, as, as Peter uh, said to me, because I was trying to figure that out. And, and Peter did say to me, and, and he was correct, that they really reconciled after TR was shot during the campaign. Lodge wrote these very heartfelt telegrams to both Edith and TR when TR was in hospital and said, oh, you know, anything we can do. And he wrote two of them over consecutive days. And I think that really healed things. Uh, Lodge was invited to TR's daughter's uh, second daughter. And I, I cannot remember her, her name, uh, but the, the wet, her, her wedding. And Lodge was the only person of that political association who was there. Elihu Root was not there. William Howard Taft was not there. All of these guys that Roosevelt had known and been very close with politically, they were not there. And, and that really said uh, a lot, I think, that that. And, and Lodge actually, Roosevelt actually wrote, a, wrote to somebody saying, you know, look, I, I get it. I understand uh, why Lodge was was pissed off a little bit, but he really never forgave uh, Ellen Root. He never forgave uh, William Howard Taft uh, for that. Uh, but Lodge, he he did. Yeah, it is. A, it is sort of striking how how, and I think that's what's wonderful about this deep correspondence. Um, um, even in telegrams, there's you, you, the physical telegram you receive, and often people will make a note or something on it. This is much more, I mean, these are physical artifacts as well as information. And they also are, it's a very dense correspondence. So even writing to someone who's in the same town you are, essentially, you know, this idea of just writing things down is so important at that time. But yeah, they they have a, a um, and they both suffered these terrible losses at the end. Um, uh, Nanny Lodge and their son uh, George Bay Lodge have died, and uh, Roosevelt loses a son in the First World War. Flyer Quentin right um, towards the end of the war. So they've they've had these things happen to, in their lives too. That in some respects draws them that grief draws them together. I'm speaking for our speaker, but no, no, you're, you're right. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, you know, Nanny Lodge's death was was just uh, overwhelming for Cabot. He wrote, he frequently wrote to Corinne Roosevelt Robinson, as I said earlier, T.R.'s sister. And he said, "I don't know. I don't. I don't belong here anymore. Uh, I don't know how I can belong." Uh, she was everything to me. Uh, but, but Lodge and Roosevelt, the thing I think that's key to understand about both of them is despite, as I said earlier, I think, despite the fact that they were born in affluent circumstances, one might think that that would make them soft. 
There was nothing soft about them. There was no quit in them. Uh, they were determined to persevere on. It didn't matter what happened. When Quentin died near the end of the war, uh, it devastated Theodore Roosevelt. He died maybe six to seven months right after the, the Quentin's passing, but still, he still pushed forward. Uh, Lodge was with his son, Bay Lodge, when he died in a terrible, agonizing illness. There was no one on the island of Tuckernuck where the two, where there, there were two, where there was no way to get a physician there. Lodge had to wait 24 hours till a doctor potentially could get there to help his son. He had to sit there literally and watch his son, who he adored, wither away, waste away in agony. So uh, these experiences that these men endured, the losses and the way these losses happened, um, really did bond them together even closer, perhaps, than they had earlier. Um, so Stephen asks, uh, what did Lodge and Roosevelt write to each other about Wilson? How did this affect Lodge's actions concerning the Treaty of Versailles? And Jay also asks, um, what did they think about World War I and Wilson's isolationism? Well, it, it, it's not too much to say that both Lodge and Roosevelt hated Woodrow Wilson. Lodge really hated Woodrow Wilson. He thought he was an intellectually, he thought he was intellectually dishonest because Wilson had been this sort of very conservative uh, governor uh, of New Jersey, had run a very conservative, democratically conservative uh, campaign. Uh, and yet suddenly he's cultivating all of these these groups, labor, et cetera. And Lodge is just like, well, this guy can't be trusted. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, hated him anyway because he had beaten him out of the chance to become president again. Uh, and then, of course, when the war begins and Wilson is doing everything he can to keep the U.S. out, uh, advocating certain policies, uh, purchasing foreign shipping, other things, uh, not rearming the U.S. in the way Lodge and Roosevelt believed uh, it should be, uh, they really uh, went out of their way to do everything they could to try to, to, try to uh, make his life as difficult as possible. And the letters that they exchange about, about uh, Lodge, I believe, says, Wilson is the worst president we've had since James Buchanan. Uh, <laughs> Roosevelt's like, he is the worst, uh, the worst ever. Brian is secretary of state. Uh, they're just, they just lodge these, no pun intended, lodge these bombs, you know, ag against him. And, and again, that was the other thing that revived that friendship was that mutual hatred of a man who they believed was trying to take all of the good work they had done to make the United States into a significant presence in the world. And, and, and Wilson was doing everything that he could uh, to undermine that. And that was Lodge's view of, of Wilson in regards to the League of Nations as well. Uh, Lodge believed, Lodge very much, to use a current uh, phrase, Lodge was very much an America first man. Uh, he believed that the United States had a, had a rendezvous with destiny, that it had a great role to play, in the world, in the League of Nations that would cause the U.S. to be subservient, to be kind of part of a, a large club, which would essentially, uh, the League of Nations that would force the U.S. to have to dictate every single move it made, uh, was not something that he could ever abide by. And Roosevelt uh, liked the idea of a League of Nations, but he believed there needed to be some kind of military force attached to it. He didn't, he believed without any kind of strength behind it, it was just a paper tiger, that it really didn't have the ability to do anything. We've just, 
I could, I could, uh, yeah, no, Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Travis Lodge belong to the Porcelain Club, the most prestigious club at Harvard. But Franklin Roosevelt was extremely upset that he was not allowed to join. So it must be extremely strong prerequisites. And what other members that we would recognize belong to this very prestigious Porcelain Club even today? That I do not know. Yeah. Uh, Peter, do you? Do you? No, I, I'm, I'm afraid that um, um, I sort of think of Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge as sort of current events from a century ago. So um, I, I think that all the, the clubs remain in the present largely private. I'm not sure that there is a wide knowledge about who participates in them. Like yes, I, I th that's that's the, I think that's sort of happened over time. I mean, people's ability to, to keep lifelong grudges on the basis of a snub they received when they were young sort of seems to have no limits. But I'm just filibustering because I can't answer your question directly. Well, I want to uh, thank our speakers this evening, and we, the books are for sale in the lobby. And I would encourage uh, everyone who's joining us online to purchase a copy through their favorite online retailer, perhaps bookshop.org. Uh, but um, and thank you very much for a wonderful pro program. Thank you.